I'm pretty sure right now I could get hurt and not ski for 10 years and still have contents to drop every day that you've never seen. You will not have to care about how you ski or how you talk or what you look like in front of the camera. If the things are relatable to the people, then people will listen or watch what you have to do or what you have to say. We all know that if we talk about somebody who, when, who like broke his back in front of everybody on TV and then start skiing again, people will go into the theaters to watch. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Athletic Stance Podcast Season 3. This season is brought to you by Cold Case Gear, one of my friends. Uh, he used to manage a company that I was sponsored by and has since gone out on his own. He is a snow sports enthusiast and has created a product that I stand by. Uh, being an entrepreneur, I know how hard it is. So I want to start spotlighting some of the up and coming people and brands that are uh, that I hope make a massive difference in the skiing community. So before uh, we jump into this episode, I want to introduce to you Mr. John Rosenberg, and he's got a quick ad for you guys. I highly recommend checking out Cold Case Gear, and yeah, here he is, and then we'll jump into an intro and this episode. Whether you spend your time ski touring, climbing mountains, or just riding inbounds, you've encountered food frozen harder than concrete and a dead, unworking cell phone. That's why we invented Cold Case Gear. We make insulated accessories for all your outdoor essentials. No frozen food, no dead cell phones. We invite you to untether from temperature and follow along with us at Cold Case Gear. What's up, guys? Welcome back to The Athletic Stance. The snow is falling, and I am super excited to launch season three of the podcast. I've got some amazing athletes and coaches lined up for this season, and I'm hoping, cross my fingers, that I will actually be able to stay consistent for once. I don't know why this game of consistency is so hard for me in the podcasting game. Oh, I do. There's lots of variables that have been in my life but it's something that I continue to have passion for and I hope that you guys continue to enjoy what I'm putting out so season three is going to start out with this wonderful man from France he was just at the high fives festival and won a uh, special jury special pick award from the judges Um, that's my best translation but he is a very unique individual when it comes to the ski world. He suffered a very serious accident at a big air event and has bounced back in a way where he's been able to turn his trials and tribulations into art and he coins his art visual lyricism. He's gone from professional skier and he's still crushes it but he is now more on the other side of the camera uh, doing lots of filming he's been able to film a couple projects since his injury and he's just a champion for mental health for um empowering women to enjoy their bodies and their beauty for what it is and overall just an amazing it was an amazing conversation for me and i really hope that you guys enjoy yesterday as i record this was october the 10th which was world mental health day and that's definitely something that i'm going to be focusing on in this podcast something that i have been focusing on for a while but will continue to as it has severely affected my life especially in the last year and a half and that's one of the facts that has gotten in the way of my consistency um but i'm back at it i feel better hopefully you guys care maybe you don't maybe you just want to hear the skiers and that's fine 
But I'm really excited for you to hear this interview uh, with one of the I, I just don't even know the words the adjectives to describe this man had a, a wonderful conversation with him he's super humble he's down to earth he's honest and vulnerable in a setting where all you guys get to hear this and he talks about some things that not I don't think anyone has ever heard um, he mentions it on the podcast that he really hasn't talked about a lot of these things. And I feel so fortunate to be the on the receiving end of hearing some of those unique uh, words and allowing you guys to hear the same. So without further ado, Mr. Jeremy Pencross. My name is uh, Jeremy Pancras, like we say it in French. Jeremy Pancras for the English talking persons. Uh, my nickname is Pen Pen. Most people call me like that. So I am from France and I have started skiing when I was two years old uh, with my pops. And when I was 11 years old, I started watching Candy Tovek's movies, Rastafari 1, 2, 3. Uh, got the chance to watch the rest of uh, the Candid Invitational live in Lacusa. And at that time, I thought it would be very awesome to start freestyle skiing. So at 11 years old, I bought my first pair. And then I was hooked. Yep. That's it. Uh, yeah. Sounds like a pretty good way to get into free skiing to me. Watching yeah. uh, one of the greats. Yeah, I got very lucky to uh, start skiing then in La Cusa, where Ken did skis every day. So when I was young and skiing with the, the club of skiing up, up there, we could see Ken did skiing up there. And at some point, he ended up skiing with us. So he was a really an awesome person to look up to. And there were so many great skiers up there in La Cusa that, I don't know. I just couldn't stop. I just wanted to do as well as them. Yeah, definitely. When did you get into competing first? Hmm. Well, when I was 15 years old, my parents, who are uh, secretary and electricians, didn't have enough money to pay for like more than two pairs of skiing a year. So straight up, when I got into the sport club up there, they found me a sponsor, which was uh, Scott. And I had to do all the competitions right away to show them that it was worth their money. So 15 years old was my first year actually free skiing, and it was also my first year competing. Crazy. Just throwing you right into it. What was that like, your first season? How did you do? What was the... Like, were you nervous? Were you just having fun? Um, I can't really remember about the nervous thing. I just remember it was really hard to get accepted in this club at that, at that time because I was from the city and I didn't really deserve this sponsorship. So the kids weren't, like, the, the nicest to me. So it was hard to, like, integrate myself. So I remember giving me, myself, like, as much as I could like investing my time into free skiing. Like I really wanted to beat these kids that were mean to me that afterwards became my best friends, of course. But yep. yeah, <laughs> that, that's kind of weird. But my first motivation was getting their mouth shut in the first place, to be honest. Yeah, totally. Especially at that age, because that's like, uh, you know, when I was, I grew up ski racing, but you know, when I was 15, it was definitely, you know, you earned a lot of respect based off of, you know, how fast you were. And I didn't get along with everyone on my team, but yeah, it's like, it's one of those motivations to, to do better. Yeah, totally. For sure. Yeah, for sure. I was like totally hooked on free skiing. Like that was also a way for me to escape the world I was living because things were complicated. Not that complicated, but you know, in a 15 years old mind, everything seems so complicated. So it was a way for me to escape this world. But then when I ended up in the mountains, 
I was still hooked up by those kind of problems with people. Yeah. So I definitely wanted to do well in competition so I could like also escape those people. Yeah, totally. What <laughs> was it? So I kept on, you know, chasing a dream. Yeah. But it was really about skiing in the first place. I wanted to do good just to become better skier, you know, so I could have even more fun as well. Yeah, totally. The better you are, the more freedom you have and the more... Yeah, the more possibilities you have on the mountain. Exactly. It's based on skills and I needed more skills so I could like go in these zones and do those rails and do those tricks. Yeah, totally. If you don't want to talk about it, it's cool. But do you mind talking a little bit about like the social stuff that you were going through at that age? Yeah, I, I have no problem talking about anything actually. Yeah. I just, uh, something that I love about your message is it's generally all about community, uh, you know, like experiencing things together with awesome people um, and, you know, like sharing those moments. But I think for me, I was bullied a lot when I was younger because I went to a private school where I was like the only kid that was get, getting out early to go ski. And it caused a lot of like social issues for me. Oh, yeah. I guess I can picture that. And um, so, yeah, what was going on that was making life so complicated for you? What was going on is that I've, I have always been a pretty hyperactive kid. Yep. So I've always been the one with hairy colors, funky gear, and I was talking a lot. So whenever people could just annoy me because I was talking a lot, they would do it. And the fact that I was always the smallest dog, I've always been a small kid, so it's easy to bully me and to talk louder because I've, I, have, I have more feminine voice than most of the people, moreover, when I was a kid. Yeah. So just people would just like, I don't know. I was also pushing my problems myself because, you know, I, I should have shut my mouth at some points where I opened it. Yeah. I was also maybe too disrespectful to some people and I regret some of the things I've done in the past and I try to make it up for that now. Yeah. Because I also some of the problems I got were due to my behavior as well. It's, it was not only because of the other people and I realize it now for sure. Definitely. So that's why I want to tell people to spread positivity because I wasn't as positive as a kid, you know, I could have, I have been cocky, I have been stupid, and I have talked bad things to people that I regret now, and I apologize for that. Yeah, definitely, I can, I can relate to you on that, for sure, I, when I was younger, I thought I was, uh, you know, hot shit, because I was doing so well in ski racing, and, you know, I was able to leave, leave school, and so, yeah, there were definitely times where, I uh, I told people I was better than them in, in whatever way, shape, or form, and then, yeah, ended up with regrets because, you know, everyone's, you know, no one's better than anyone else, and it's, the, it's definitely those types of uh, that lack of humility that can cause, uh, yeah. causes people harm. Yeah, 100% agreed on that. I wasn't... Yeah, I had a lack of humility for sure. Cockiness was part of the fact that people weren't accepting. Yeah. Because I, you know, I didn't deserve to be accepted by some people. But because those people were being so mean to me, I felt like the need to be cocky, to prove them I was better than them because they were richer, they had better sponsors, they were better at skiing, and they had the ladies looking up to them to them you know yeah so i wanted all of that so i thought cockiness would be my way out which wasn't and when i started actually like being real be, being true to me mm -hmm. then good things started happening to me for sure yeah so i want to spread this word of like positivity and yeah we're all on the same boat in this shit you know definitely so might as well all be kind to each other so we can move forward and you know, push each other in the right way instead of comparing. Uh, I'd say it, I'm sorry, but 
you know, it's it's a bad thing to like compare dicks. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, no, there's no point know. at all. And um, when do you think you had that like that realization? And it probably wasn't like it. Maybe it was an overnight thing, but what was you know when did you start kind of gaining perspective on that you have now? I think it started by the age of uh, 19 when I got kicked out of the of this team in Lacusa for some bullshit that I didn't deserve. That's for sure, but whatever. I started really traveling and discovering the world. That's the first season. I went to Breckenridge for three months. I wasn't. I didn't speak French. Oh, I didn't speak English. My bad. <laughs> I have a fun fact about that. You you'll laugh at it. Uh, we we went to a shop one day and I was looking for wax, but the, the word wax in French is fart. <laughs> so I was asking in like in every <laughs> shop I would pull up and be like. Um, excuse me, uh, do you have some fat? And first shop laughed on me, second shop laughed on me, <laughs> third shop. They explained me what was the actual word. Yep. So, you know, when you, you, you pull up into a country and you don't speak the language, like you don't even have the words to be cocky. Yeah. So at some point you start acting like everybody and you start being the shy kid a little bit more, you know? Yeah. Because you can't, you can't talk every time, every time you want because you don't even have the words to do it. Totally. So when I started like looking around and like, you know, realizing what was, what was the world really made of, I think I started stepping back from my, uh, from my cocky seat and, you know, appreciating a little bit everybody, even the people I didn't like. Yeah. Which made me, which made me change for sure. Definitely. And then it was shortly after that, that you started competing in some of the bigger competitions, right? Or around that time? Yeah. Yeah, everything went pretty fast because uh, at 19, so I got kicked out of the, this team in France, went to the U.S. And when I went to the U.S., I got invited. I, I, I entered the Aspen Open, ended up in the sixth place. So it was my first time being on the back of a sled in – Super finals with Carl Fosvet, Tim McChesney, all those big dogs I was looking up to when I was a kid. And so since I ended up sixth there, uh, Rafael Rigazzoni, who's a very important guy in the, in the ski community in Europe, invited me in the, at the Frostgen event, the Big Air uh, in Val d'Isère, where I ended up getting sixth. And this season, I got six at European Open, Austrian Open. Uh, I got a podium at uh, Andreas Hadvey Invitational. Yep. And then got invited to uh, Jan Olson Invitational. And my career, my international career actually started from there. Yeah. So I'm pretty blessed. I got kicked out by that time. <laughs> Isn't it funny how sometimes what seems to be the worst you know, the worst thing exactly. in the world turns to be, like, the best thing for you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, a lot of things. Yeah. My back, my back, for example, I'm pretty sure we'll talk about it later. Yeah. But I would never, uh, if I had to do it again, I'd do it again. Yeah. It was one of the biggest blessings I ever had. Made me change, gave me another perspective on career. Yeah. A lot of things happen, and you don't know why, and... There is actually a reason. Yeah, definitely. I can 100% relate. I figure we might as well talk about it now if it, since we brought it up. Uh, but let's start with, you've had some other injuries before that, yeah? Like me, me <laughs> yeah. stuff? So, yeah, I think, I think over the course of the past 11 years, I've done more than five years rehab. Yeah, wow. I'm just very good at stacking shots and putting them into hard drive for the bad times so like i'm pretty sure right now i could get hurt and not ski for 10 years and still have contents to drop every day that you've never seen i'm really good at hiding stuff damn okay <laughs> yeah for sure that's crazy uh so what was like your first big injury and how did it happen first uh, major injury was blowing my knee my right knee at uh, Killington Dew Tour, the, the season, so uh, like my, my career started 
2011, blew my knee on 2012. So I just signed a very good contract with Volkov Skis. And I was so happy to start. I was invited to every event this year. And on the second ever, uh, on the second event, I blew my knee. It was in Killington. I did a cork seven, went too short. It was, uh, I was following uh, Phil Casabon. So as a, like, I was the biggest fan boy right behind him. And it fucked up. <laughs> so I blew my right knee and it took a lot of time because um, when surgery happened, uh, I was very high on uh, what they gave you, the codeine, not the codeine, but uh, the, the morphine. Mm -hmm. I was really high on morphine and it acts really weird on me. So when I woke up, instead of laying in bed, I just stood up to try and go pee. Yeah. And of course, my body wouldn't react. So I fell on my back and we didn't realize by that time, but I, I fucked up both meniscus right after the surgery oh. so it took me nine months to start skiing again with the worst pain ever and i only took i only did like a four month season and had to get another surgery on it so first major major um, problem was very major it was worse than my back because it took me maybe two years to get back from and it's still painful Dang. But because of myself again, you know, mm -hmm. can blame on anybody. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's it, sometimes it's very hard to think straight when you're on morphine, that's for sure, or on any sort of... Uh... Yeah, and I was young. I didn't know. That was the first time I was getting surgery. Yep. I had no idea. Nah, I wouldn't make the, any more mistakes, you know. Right. <laughs> I, I thought I was dreaming. Yeah, okay. I thought I was dreaming. I wasn't. Yeah. And then... So then I blew. Then I did uh, left knee, collarbone. Uh, I did a lot, man. Yep. One of the one of the worst, one of the most annoying actually was my heel, my right heel. My flight got uh, canceled to, from the World Cup in Park City to the World Cup in La Clusa, to the SFR tour that was a World Cup at the time. And so uh, I showed up to, uh, to France the day after the second training day. So the competition was right after and none of my shit pulled up. So I had to rent helmet, goggles, skis, everything for the contest. I did two runs training and straight into my run. I think it was one of the best runs I ever did, but I overshot the last trick oh. and went to the dead flat of the last jump and jumps in La Cusa are the poppiest you've ever ridden for sure so I hurt my heel at that time it wasn't broken but it was just a bruise but five years later I still feel it wow so this season I was only able to do one run quality and one run final that's all, all I could do I could do in one run training as well so I was just doing a straight run Waiting for an hour, doing qualies, praying to qualify, and then doing finals. I was really lucky because I made it through every final this season as well. Damn. All because you're heel. Still. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I still feel it now when the weather is bad and, yeah, my heel hurts. Yeah. Just like a really deep bone bruise? Yeah, I think so. Nothing was broken. It wasn't that blue or anything. That's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, it was bad, <laughs> very bad. Dang. And then in 2017 was your back, right? 2017 was my back, yeah, exactly. I was doing fine. It had been two years that I was out of surgery or anything. Oh, well, I got surgery to remove some of the screws I had, like in my collarbone, or, but nothing bad. But, yeah, my back. 2017 8th of October 2017 yeah that's crazy I have a similar story of breaking my back not as gnarly or like as um as much hype around it obviously but I uh tomahawked into a tree at you know like four and a half tomahawks after I hit probably like a 30 40 foot air dropped down, broke my ski when I landed and it sent me tomahawking towards the line of trees and ended up breaking my back. And I was super lucky, uh, 
because my helmet was in my backpack where I hit the tree. So if I would have hit Damn. my head, it would have been, yeah. you know, all over. Or if that helmet wasn't there where I hit the tree, things probably would have been a lot different. And I know that you had. Yeah, for sure. Stars aligned. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know what all, you know, how much you want to relive what happened, but I'm sure. Oh, I don't care talking about it. Cool. Yeah. I don't mind talking about it. I'm sure it's all good. Would love to hear. Kinda... I, I made piss with it, you know? Yeah, totally. Uh, I know it was super gnarly, so I'd love to hear kind of, you know, your perspective of it all and then, you know, what you've taken from it. Because I've, you know, the the art that you've put out in the last couple of years has been amazing. And, you know, like you said, it's been one of the best things. Thank you. So, um, would love to hear. Yeah, just kind of that whole yeah, story. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, I still remember it as the best day of my life, for sure, because it was my city, my people, even my parents showed up, whereas they don't have really the time to show up to any of my contests. But uh, everything was going fine. I did. I qualified in first place, which was amazing because I didn't do big air for the past two years because I was traveling with my girlfriend and filming mini videos just having fun but I at that time it was hard to concentrate because you know girlfriend things mm -hmm. <laughs> so I wasn't like really focused on like doing big stuff I was just having fun in the snow park whenever I could but uh, doing big air is something else you really want to be concentrated on and um Luckily, my ex-girlfriend wasn't there at that time, and things went well in the qualies. Uh, I got first, and then on the night of the final, it was like the mega sunset that we get in NC, and there were more people in the crowd that I've never seen, that I've ever seen in a contest, even at X Games or Olympics. So it was awesome. Yeah. And then, yeah, I, I did that dub 14 right before. It, it went well, but I thought I could do better. I wasn't aiming for any podium, any podium or any glory or anything. I just knew I had that dub 16 in, uh, that I did like a couple of years back. And I was like, yeah, I like the jump. The vibe is awesome. Let's do it. And when I did that first Cork 7, it went well. And then when I grabbed my Lucane to like pull my stomach up and just spin as much as I could to bring that 16 to my feet. Um, I think a photographer clicked, so I saw white when I was supposed to see black when I was looking at the sky. And I thought I was done with the trick when I actually ended on my head. Yeah. I thought I was about to stomp. In my head, I was like, boom, that, that's the trick. Uh, no, when I saw the ground, I was like, oh. <laughs> that's nope, not, not it. Not good. <laughs> That's not it. That's not it. And um, uh, you guys maybe don't know that, but I didn't pass out at all. I remember everything. I actually didn't break my back on the first impact. Um, people can see it on the movie, but on the first impact, I land on my head. And then I rebound and land on my back after, after a flip. And that's after this rebound that I break my back. So I actually remember everything, every feeling. Uh, all the blood in my goggle when I was looking at, at my parents because they were right in front of my eyes when I was like looking the crowd. So I could see my parents like under shock. They wouldn't be, they, they weren't realizing what was happening, but I had that little peak in my back, that, like that little thing in my back and I was feeling like, oh, all right, that, uh, I broke my back, that's for sure. Yeah. I didn't know at that time if feeling my feet or not was a good thing yep. and that's the first thing I was asking the doctors of course yeah and they've been very good to me but yeah I remember everything then they asked me if I needed any morphine or anything I was like uh, I didn't want any any painkillers or anything that would put me in a second state because I knew we would have to take important decision and I didn't want to uh, to have my parents take the decisions instead of me because you know I did it on my own they don't have to suffer uh, 
out of the things I've done to myself. So yeah. it was painful, but no painkillers. Yeah, totally. I, uh, I didn't take any painkillers when I broke my back or when I did ACL surgery or when I broke my tibia the last time. I haven't done any pain pills. And I feel like it has really helped me heal a lot better. Um, well, the so healing yeah, side was something else. But during yeah, yeah. The, the accident, yeah, that's how it happened. And then you were in surgery. They did surgery, right? Yeah, it was really easy. Uh, they, I got hurt on Saturday night, Sunday morning. I got surgery. Uh, and Monday morning, I started walking again. Wow. So, and I, so Monday morning, started walking, stayed there to make sure my state was stable. And only stayed in the hospital until Wednesday. I was in the hospital for like four days, I think. Then straight back home for a month and a half. Dang. That's yeah. crazy. That's so nuts. Walking like the day after surgery. Yeah, I wouldn't, I would have never thought of it. I thought they would give me, a, I don't know the word in English, but that thing you put around your stomach and your back, like to make you not move, like a cast around your mm -hmm. chest. I didn't have that. I had nothing else than, I had nothing. It was just, a broken bone, you know, and it, yeah. since it's in the back, I just like it just told me to chill as much as I could. But I'm a little like, hyperactive, so I was up a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I remember when I broke my back. I don't think I walked. I didn't have to have surgery, which was super lucky. Um, but like two days after, I was literally just walking circles around my house because I was so amped up and couldn't, you know. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I, I need to do something. Yeah, whatever that's what it is. I'm doing right now, actually. I, I wish there was somebody filming right me right now because I am circling around the house <laughs> so much. <laughs> I can't like lay in, in couch and talk to people. It's impossible for me. Yeah, totally. Still more over at, for a month and a half. <laughs> yeah, if I wasn't at my computer, I'd be doing the same thing. Whenever I'm on my phone, I'm doing laps around the house for sure. Yeah. Yeah. it's hard um, for me to concentrate yeah totally so what was that month and a half recovery like i think um you know you were already into filming edits and and doing everything but it you know you say that it's one of the best things that ever happened to you so how did you take something that could have been like the worst thing that ever happened to you or you know some people might take it as like you know it would end their career and yeah. end what they were doing. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, obviously you, you have such a passion for skiing, so it wouldn't do that for you, but how did you, you know? Um, well, it was a long process. What I'm about to talk about, I've never talked about it in social media or anything. I've talked to like my close ones about it, but I went into depression right away. Because, yeah. um, of course, I was seeing life differently, you know, I was like, I was looking at myself in the mirror and said, telling myself, look at what you've done to yourself. Like, you're, you're pushing the limits of your body and you almost died. Or you could have been in a wheelchair forever or worse, you know. So yeah. I was thinking about that. Plus, I was mixing it with a lot, lot, lot of codeine, a lot of painkillers, strong painkillers. And by that time I was smoking a lot of weed. Yep. So the mix of it all made me totally bipolar and depressive. So I was crying a lot. I was just by myself in the house watching movies because I couldn't concentrate on anything because I was so high that it was yeah. impossible for me to concentrate on anything so i wasn't doing any editing anything by that time i remember now um it was a very tough moment i was very yeah i was the most depressive i've been in my entire life that's for sure i remember being on the edge of my balcony at some times and being like this gotta end this is this is too much you can't handle this shit anymore 
Yeah. But then I was thinking of my family and all the people that surround me. And yeah, that was hard, man. That was very hard. I had a tough time surviving it. Yeah. So when, when I actually figured out that it was the drugs that was doing that to me, I started doing less and less because, of course, I was addicted to it. They gave me so much, man. This is stupid. Like how much medicine they gave me, like yeah. without psychological help. When I, when I think of it now, that, that it's, it's a relative, you know. It's, it's stupid the amount of drugs they were giving me, even though I was in pain. But if you want to give that much drug to a kid that went through some, some shit, you're going to give him some psychological help as well. Because I was missing that. And when I was trying to talk to my close ones, they were always telling me, oh, you, you only see the dark things. And, you know, just trying to help someone that just got, went through a breakup. But it was different. I was going through something that I couldn't handle by myself. Yeah. So I started watching a lot of documentaries about people go through some stuff, got, to, got into rap and started thinking differently. Instead of listening to sad rap songs, I started listening to stupid trap shit which actually helped me think of something else, you know? Mm -hmm. when people think about, like, yell about money and girls and just stupid things. You, you stop talking, you stop thinking about the sad, the sad things and start laughing in front of your TV. That's yeah. what helped me go through it. And, of course, the people around me, but they wouldn't realize how, how bad was the t situation at that time yeah totally yeah i went through serious depression for like s over six months after i broke my back um there was a, a series of you know events that kind of led to that but um i started drinking a lot that was how i was like coping and like uh self-medicating with everything and <clears throat> i was undergoing, you know, an identity change. I don't think it was quite as, you know, may, uh, yeah, uh, you know. I think really those compare. situations are comparable, you know. Yeah. Like you wouldn't compare. Like people would go through depression for a girlfriend they've been dating for a month, and mm -hmm. people would be like, "Oh, this guy suicide for nothing." No, he suicided because like his mental health was very bad and something very small for other people affected him much more than it would affect anybody else. But you can't compare, uh, you know, it's something you can't compare. Yeah. You can't compare it with people. You can say, no, it wasn't as bad as you. Maybe it was in your mind, you know? Yeah. Yep. And that's why health, health issues are so hard to, like to realize and to help because you, you never realize how bad people are feeling because you don't think they would be feeling so bad. You know, people would, would be thinking I almost lost everything. I actually only broke my back. But the fact that I was under so many drugs and that I was, you know, I'm a hyperactive kid. So when you lay me on a couch, I start thinking and thinking and thinking and overthinking two, three, four times more than anybody. Yeah. I know that one for sure. I was just talking to someone about this and I, man, you get me thinking about something and I will think about all of the aspects about it. And it's sometimes it's a good thing to think that analytically, but sometimes you just drive yourself crazy because there's always yeah. more to think about. Of course. Yeah. I, I made myself sad. Uh, nobody else made myself sad. I like, it wasn't even about the crash or maybe not being able to ski or you know it was just myself being dumb with myself not being nice not being kind with myself i was treating me myself bad i was eating yeah. bad i was smoking way too much i was not trying to see the end of the tunnel i was pushing i was digging my grave on my own 
Yeah. You know, every night I would go to bed being like, if this keeps going, I'm going to kill myself tomorrow. But in the morning, I would wake up and first thing first, uh, I would take as many drugs as I could. Yeah. And so I didn't help myself mentally and physically. And that's why right now I want to tell the people that we're all made of the same blood. We're all the same. And it's not because of any fame, any glory, any money that your problems aren't problems, you know. And you don't have to blame yourself for being sad, but you have to blame yourself for not finding a way out. And finding a way out is talking to other people and actually listening to what they say. Yeah, totally. It's amazing how much uh, valuable perspective other people can have. And sometimes it's so hard to accept help from other people, especially you know, like, uh, of course, of course. Yeah. And if you're a so. proud person, if you're very proud, which I am, I've always been a very proud person. So like whenever people would tell me something I, and I think it's wrong, whatever they say, they can talk for hours. My opinion wouldn't change. And that's why I'm saying that this injury helped me grow and was actually a blessing it's because it made me realize that i was a part of something bigger than i thought i wasn't only a skier going through some shit you know i was a human i was a human being being part of a bigger community that lived the same problem as me and when i actually recovered from this injury i thought it was time for me to actually open my mouth and start talking to the people because I was taking so much the judgment of people before that. And I was taking, I was thinking of the judgment of people, but I wasn't taking in perspective what people would say to help me. Well, now I'm trying to do everything the opposite, just not care about anything people tell me that is bad. And whatever people tell me to help me, even if it's wrong or it's said wrong, I take it in. Yeah, totally. And take it as a way to get better. That's, uh, that's awesome. So how did you, besides trap music, how did you find your way like out of that hole? Was there a specific moment when you realized like, things were gonna get better or you actually saw the light at the end of the tunnel or you were like uh you know i have i have hope again um it was actually i remember this moment we were watching a uh, parker white uh the big pictures movie with yep. uh with a friend of mine Loba. And we were watching this movie and he was like, yeah, you're about to go back in rehab and everything with what you're thinking of. And I'm like, damn, what those guys are doing with like the imagery and stuff. Like, I, I think like with, with the gear I, I have and the skills I've learned over the past years, I can do the same kind of filming, but differently and doing it my way with a little more token. My main inspiration by that time was uh, Gang of Biarritz, which is a movie about the surfers that re uh, revolutionized the surfing in France. And most of them ended up with drug problems or uh, gang problems, those kind of stuffs. And I realized that I was more into hearing them talk about their their stories than watching them actually surf and i thought that it would be it would be pretty awesome to talk about our problems instead of just bragging about our tricks so that was my way out my way out was actually taking my camera and starting to film what was around me to record actually voices instead of just tricks record what people have to say about me and try to help them move on with their issues in life with their problems in life yeah that's how i that's how i moved on i moved on by focusing on something 
So I wasn't me, you know. I wasn't thinking mm -hmm. about, yeah, let's rehab so you can do a top 10 again. No, I was thinking, oh, let's rehab so you can hold the camera again and film all those people that you've always dreamed to film. So you have reason to go with Candido X and hear him talk about it. I haven't done it yet, but one day I'll be filming Candy Tovex. If Candy Tovex yeah. ever listened to that thing, I'll film you, my man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people, like, people know Candy Tovex. People know Holy is down is his career. But I'm pretty sure that if you pull up with a project talking about his actual life, his love life, his everything you know people will be as much interested into the character than they will be into their skiing because yeah those people with extraordinary life also have extra extraordinary problems 100 percent. they can overcome those then you can overcome those like yeah. a lot of people broke up with their girlfriends right before winning x games like, if this guy who broke up with his girlfriend and won exams the day after, then you listen to his story and you're like, oh, maybe I can move on from my breakup. Yeah. Totally, man. No, I think that that's, uh, you know, such an inspiration and, you know, something that uh, people say w uh, if you're struggling with mental health is, you know, stop focusing on yourself and go focus on other people, focus on helping other people and see what it does inside you. And yeah. that's, you know, that's exactly what you're saying for sure. Yeah. Um, how long was it until you were out skiing again? I know it was a pretty quick recovery. Oh, it was mad quick. Um, yeah. And I think like if the doctor is like, and if I was a little stupid after a month and a half, I was feeling like I was okay. Like yep. 8th, 8th of October, uh, I got hurt uh, on the 1st of December. Like with the feelings I had in my body, I would have been able to ski. But I started skiing back on the 10th of uh, January. Yeah, I think it took me like two months and a half, three months. It was mad easy. And then uh, I did pretty well on the recovery. You know, it's, it's just a broken bone. So after a month and a half, it's like even after three weeks, it's totally healed up. Uh, you don't feel any more pain. Maybe some little, some little pain that I'll keep for my entire life, but I can deal with it. Yep. And, um, but I started filming with, um, what's his name again? Uh, backflip legend from the World Tour. Tour. Yeah, Seb Michaud, exactly. So, yeah. um I started filming a movie about him. So my first day skiing was actually with a camera and a camera backpack that was, I don't know the, pound, the, the number of pounds it was, but you can picture how heavy is a camera bag with everything. My first day was a ski with a park skis in 40 centimeters, fresh powder, holding a gimbal with a camera and a microphone. So I was working on my back while working on my skis on the first day and I started filming him and hiking around and doing free ride with them for a month and a half. Yeah, totally. After I thought three months. I saw one video of a GoPro POV from on your Instagram recently. Yeah. Uh, the first day back and it looked like you were going pretty ham. Yeah, that was the day before I uh, started filming. Yeah, I was stupid. See, the stupid things you do. Well, that mm -hmm. was stupid for sure. They told me, all right, you can go ski, but you cannot crash. So, you know, I was just skiing. But when, when I ski, like, I cannot just do spins on the, on the slopes. So I went a little ham. When, when I think of it, you know, by that time when I went home, I was like, I might have skied a little too hard today. And <laughs> a, year, a year after I edited the shot, I was like, all right, I was skiing the same that if I did, never had surgery on my back. Which was yep. very stupid because I could have gotten hurt at that time. Nothing happened. God bless. But nobody should do what I've done this day. For I, sure. Yep. I broke my back on February 28th of 2016. And I was skiing April 4th, something like that. Yeah. 
of 2016 and I was wearing that kind of cast thing that you talked about. It was like, um, it was something that I could remove, but it, it kept my spine. So, um, it, my lower <laughs> spine wouldn't bend yeah. and I was skiing around with that and I was doing backflips. And if I would have under rotated and scorpioned, it would have yeah. you know probably yeah. been similar to your situation. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, but and, since you don't feel it, you're just like, oh, it's not gonna happen, you know. It's not. It's like when you're drunk and you're mm-hmm. like, yeah, I can go home for sure. Yeah, you can right? go home, and and 99% per, of the time you'll go home. But if something happens, then it's game over. It's not just a broken bone. It's it might pull you in a wheelchair. So I regret. This is one of the things I regret doing in my life for sure, and that's why I dropped that clip. I dropped yeah. it to not to brag about it. I dropped it to say, all right, what I've done this day was way too much. I should have never done it. Yeah, should have done it differently. That cockiness, exactly. you know, mm-hmm. for me was was back at the forefront. And I wanted I wanted to prove something, whether it's to myself exactly. or, or other exactly. people around, you know. Exactly. Prove yourself. And and after that, that I, it also pushed me even more into my projects where I realized that, you don't have to do it for the clout or you don't have to do it for yourself. You've proven enough and you don't need to prove everything every day. You don't need to wake up and prove the world anything or yourself anything. You can also have a normal day like everybody. Just leave, you know, and not put yourself in danger. Yeah, totally. It's hard, though. It's definitely hard. That's it's hard. For sure. Even more when you're hyperactive. Because uh, mm-hmm. whenever you have two seconds on the lift, you're just looking around and you, you you see those cliffs and you see those other riders that know who you are and you're just like, man, I want to show them what, what I'm capable of even more after a back surgery. I want to be a hero. I, wanna, like, I want them to think that I'm superhuman, but it might put me a wheel, in a wheelchair. So I want to say to people, they don't need to be a hero every day. From time to yeah. time, it's good. It's good, but there are times, there are like good times to do it. That wasn't the right time. Yeah, totally. And I think something that I've really been loving about the sport is, uh, you know, you opened up a whole nother avenue for yourself by overcoming those interpersonal obstacles and then using them as a tool to further help the community. So like talking about everything that you're talking about and using the vlogs and your, you know, your Instagram to express, you know, some, sometimes it's partying and having fun, but sometimes I think it was like two or three days ago, you posted about mental health and like you've used these things that have, uh, plagued you and now are turning around and, and getting to help other people. And, um, when I interviewed, uh, Pod Hagland, Mr. Payban, um, you know, he's someone that I think is, he really has a ton of fun when he's out and that's why people watch him. And like for you, you, you turned it into telling people's stories. And so I think like there's an avenue for anyone out there and you don't always have to be pushing for the bigger tricks the more you know the the bigger rotations and sometimes you can allow your story or your perspective or your uh you know your unique life experience to affect others instead of just trying to um prove you know like prove your worth through being the biggest baddest best you know. Yeah, I, I agree totally. And that's why, like, when I stopped editing the movie last year, I was like, this is my first and last movie. It was so hard, so painful. It took me so much time. Like, it took my life for three, like, the, the filming part was easy, but editing got me crazy. I went back into depression editing this movie and just thinking of the interviews I had to, to do, th- the things I wanted to tell the people, because before that, I never told anybody to anything i was just doing ski porn i was just doing 
videos of myself skiing or traveling. I was trying to like share the good vibe, but I was not trying to tell people anything. But why I say that this back, back problem was a blessing is because it made me realize I could, people will actually start listening to what I have to say. And it is time for me to say those things that other people in the industry don't say. They don't say it yet. And that's why I made that post a couple of days ago because I, I am not big on Instagram. Maybe a little bigger than the average people, but compared to other writers that surround me, I am pretty much nothing. You know? But still, I have those people that actually listen to me and see me as, th as this guy who overcame those problems. So when I actually dropped the movie, people would not come back to me and talk about that triple of uh, Torin or this part of Jake. They would actually tell me, oh, you helped me grow up. You helped me grow, go through those problems with my girlfriends. Oh, I broke my uh, thumb the other, the other week and uh, it's painful. I can skate, but I know that if I'm patient enough, I, I can move on and go back to skating. And, and all those things actually drove me into creating this new project I'm up to right now. And I'm trying to like get rid of all the filters we had before, but like the partying, the everything we didn't dare to talk about before. And yeah. I am lucky enough to have conscious sponsors that actually let me do my projects the way I want to do it. So yeah. this upcoming project will be no filters and talking about actually the people and how we can move on from the stuff that are hard in life. Not just yeah. the skiing. The skiing will be freaking awesome, man. We got so much content this year. So much good content. Like Even if I don't pass the message, I want to pass. Just the ski porn that will be in it will be mind-blowing i know that i know that maybe it sounds cocky but i don't think that's a thing as well like before i thought like everything i would say would be cocky but sometimes it's not cockiness it's just like actual facts yeah it's confidence and and, and it's it's um it's real you know it's Exactly. Before, I thought that being confident and saying that I was good at this thing was being cocky. It is not. It is not. I know I am good at that thing, and I know that the skiing of Henrik in the movie is awesome. You know? Yeah. And it is not bragging about it, and I think people don't dare to say they are beautiful or they don't dare to say they are good at this thing because they are scared that people which judge them will judge them and think they are cocky. But they yeah. don't have to hide their the, the good things they do in life. I think yeah. it's a good thing being a little proud of yourself sometimes. Not too much, but being a little proud of yourself to help you, you know, being confident. And if you're confident, then you'll dare talking to that girl you'll never, you've never dared talking to. Yeah, <laughs> totally, definitely. I think it, you know, it's super important to, to, like, when you know yourself, when you actually take the time to get real with yourself, which is, you know, what I think the the back injury did for you. It certainly did for me, and continues to for me. Um, it gives you the ability to, you know, understand the subtle difference of like cockiness and confidence. And exactly, like, you know, you can be confident in yourself and let yourself shine, but also still have humility and, and not think that you're, uh, you know, not radiate this like feeling of like betterness or like competition, you know, you can just kind of claim what's yours. Yeah. Exactly. You have to, because, you know, like I'll take that as an example, but like one of the main reason I I'm doing this movie is because of the women that are, that's around me. Like none of them feel good in their life. 
Like none of them feel like they're beautiful or, not, or they're not worth what people say about them. Man, like at some point, like you are beautiful. You have a beautiful soul. You're giving yourself a hundred percent on what you are doing. And at some point, just accept the fact that you are this thing, which is good and use it to, you know, move on in life. Stop thinking that because you have this little button on your face that you are ugly. This is something nobody cares about. Everybody gets those, you know. What's the name in English? Uh, the thing on your face when you're adolescent. Mole, oh, pimple? <laughs> yeah, when you have a pimple. It doesn't mean not because you have a pimple that you're not beautiful anymore. Yeah. You know, it's not because you gain a little weight that you're not beautiful anymore. It's not because you're growing old and you cannot do those triples anymore that you're not a good rider anymore. Yeah, you know? totally. It's just evolution. And you got to yep. accept that. And I think that if people start accepting themselves are they, as they are, they will be more confident and will care less about what people say about them because people can be mean or can just like not think enough when they're drunk or whatever and can affect you which shouldn't yeah totally definitely and i think that it's one of those things where if you're so uh you know self-conscious if you're only conscious of yourself but only conscious of the flaws that you have that you perceive of yourself then you are aren't spending that time understanding what you are good at and that's when you know like if you didn't come to this realization about you being good at editing film and telling you know storytelling through you know the visual lyricism it the world wouldn't see it and then people's lives wouldn't be changed from it. If you continued to be as, you know, just self-conscious of, of the, the feelings that you were feeling, then that would have never come into the world. And it's like, once you can uh, release the idea of, you know, needing to be perfect, and then you just understand that you kind of already are just the way that you are. Exactly. Which that. we're not, we're never perfect. I still yes. try to move on. Everybody needs to understand they have like problems. Like my thing is, that I cut I cut people when they talk. That's a that's a family thing. If you start talking, and I'm doing the best I can right now. If you are talking, like most other, moreover, when we're talking in French, I would start talking while you are talking. And that's something I needed to move on from. I needed to change because you can't act with people when you travel and people don't do that. In France, it's accepted, but it's, in Canada, it's something very bad. Then, yeah, th this needs to change. But some things for sure, like I accepted the fact that, yes, I am good at editing. Like I realized it. And that's why it was so hard last year. It's when I was editing the movie, like, Everything, I was like, oh, maybe I could change it. I could change it. I would spend hours and hours and hours of like changing a part that was actually like three weeks later. I was like, all right, the, the part I've done three weeks ago was good. Now what I've changed is shit. <laughs> so let's go back to what I've done. Like I trusted myself. And in fact, yep. it, it ended up working, you know? Yeah, totally. And that's why I wanted to continue because now when I edit, when I'm, yeah, I'm in front of my computer, I am 100% sure that this will work. It, it won't work for 100% of the person. And, and yeah. I accept that. I accept the fact that people will have a different of opinion of mine, of myself. And it's fine. You know, People will never like what I do, will never like what my skiing, will never like my way of talking. And I even met people that told me they don't like the my accent but I, i'm fine with that i made peace with that and making peace with that helped me move on in life with love life drug issues and everything yeah which i'm blessed and i want to share the world the word about it definitely
Do you mind talking about uh, any of the relationship issues that you've had and how you've overcome that? Because that's something, you know, I've never been good at relationships and that's something that, um, <laughs> you know, I think yeah. uh, a lot of skiers might, you know, like have issues with. That's kind of a silent... Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I can. I will just talk slowly to make sure I don't say anything bad. I don't want to hurt anybody that was in my life. And due to the fact that I'm um, personality that people follow on the gram and I post pictures of the girlfriends and everything, people will quickly realize who I am talking about. But um, I have been... I have been pretty stupid. Like, I, I'll say that honestly. I, I am a lover. Like, I love women. Mm -hmm. Not in the fact, I love them in numbers, but I le love them deep, deeply when I'm with one. And I yes. am too much, I am way too invested into an, a relationship when I shouldn't. And I would give, I would give away my life and my lifestyle for somebody, which I did over the past relationships I had and I kind of lost myself and lost confidence of myself in these relationships. I have been, I have been giving away places at competition I should have gone to just to go to vacations for the golf, which I should have never done, not that I know. But that's yeah. the things in life that you got to do to actually realize it years later and be like, all right, no, I won't do it again. But what I want to say to the people that listen to the podcast is whenever you meet someone, don't hide any of the things you are. Don't say you're a cook, whereas you've cooked twice. Don't say you have slept with one woman, whereas you have slept with a hundred. Because all those things over the course of the years will come out at some point and punch you in the fucking face yeah which is really hard because then you create problems you shouldn't and that's why right now i'm put, posting all those nude like half nude pictures on on the gram it's because i've always been taking pictures of naked women because i like the body of everybody i think i can make people look even better than they are because I find the right angles with my camera and it helped a lot of the girls I've been hanging with to like find confidence in their body. They're like, oh, my booty too big. Oh, wait, I'll change the angle without telling her. And then I show her the picture and she's like, oh, I'm actually acceptable or I, I am cute, you know? So like <laughs> in my way, taking pictures of naked girls like is a way for me to help them move on with the issues they have with their bodies. Mm -hmm. So just don't hide anything. Just whenever you meet the one you will actually love or spend time with, just tell her everything, even if it's painful. Like if, if she doesn't want to date you because you had sex with more than five persons, then, you know, it's not somebody that is that is meant for you. Yeah. Because things happen and you don't have to lie. Never lie. Yeah. Never lie. It's it's a hard thing not to lie, you know. I've done things that I'm not proud of, but now when I meet a girl or when I meet yeah, when I meet anybody that I actually want to spend time with, even with friends who have like different political uh, opinions like I will tell them right away I, I think this way we, we, we don't need to talk about it but this is who I am be true to yourself be real just keep it real you know definitely yeah a hundred percent I think that you know I've definitely gotten caught up in trying to be someone that I wasn't and then it stressed me out. I wasn't actually happy because I thought that I needed to be the person that I told, you know, that the exactly. women yeah, that I was. Then you try and act like a different person, but 
this will last for a couple months, a couple of weeks, a couple of years. But then after, after a couple, you know, all those times, you're just like, you know, natural will come back and you will either disappoint the, the person or you will have changed enough for this person to accept you. But then you're not yourself again and you'll end up being a sad. And being sad in a relationship is bad because you will end up with a breakup. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. And then you're always just trying to catch up to, yeah, something, something that you're not. You're always uh, trying to work to be something that you're not instead of just accepting yourself. Exactly. For who you are. You want to be and yourself I, more of in a relationship, you know, when you're naked laying next to your girlfriend and she asks you about that thing that happened two years ago and you told her the opposite a year ago, what are you going to do? Are you going to lie again to protect what you have right now or you're going to tell the truth and probably lose her? Well, of course you'll lie and you'll lie again and you'll build up a whole relationship on lies and this is just a sin. It is bad. It is bad for your mental health as well. Because by the, at the end, like a lot of the mental issues I was going through was due to the fact that I was a lover and I was trying to lie to myself and to the people around me. Not a bad imp important thing. I've never, I've never done something that so bad that, you know. But still, still, I was losing time and I should have say the things that was important right away instead of lying and having layers of lies over layers of lies and then always being on your phone being worried about her discovering this thing or me knowing those things that i shouldn't you know yeah don't lie never lie that's the most important thing in relationships stay true even if you might lose the people you don't want to leave on lives. Yeah, definitely. And then, you know, that's, that's how you know that you've, you know, really given your all in, in any sort of relationship, whether friendship or intimate, you know, is that you've, you've told the truth and you've been yourself a hundred percent. And then exactly you know, people will like, they can get mad at you for this opinion or what you've done, but then you, you, you will have made peace with yourself. And that's the most important because at the end of the line, you will end up on your own in your grave, you know? Mm -hmm. This is something that I have understood. By the end, at the end of the line, you will live your life in your own brain. You're, you are not in anybody's body. You are not in anybody's mind. And everything you live, you live it through yourself. Even though something you do will affect other people and other people's mind and you, you will take it in it will make you suffer at the end it will be just you and your own lies and your own stupid things you're done so might as well be honest a hundred percent even if it might cost you a bunch it will cost you way less than lying for sure a hundred percent yeah definitely and i think you know it it may cost a lot but it will give you freedom and nothing can really truly buy you know amen buy to that. you freedom amen for sure yeah yeah you'll be free you'll be free and i wasn't free for a lot of time and i am finally free because whenever i meet someone like you know have you ever taken pictures of people naked yeah you can see it on the ground Right. You know, have you have you hung out with a lot of girls? Well, yeah, I assume it now. Before I would say, yeah, I had sex with uh, three, four girls. Come on, you know, you know how this life goes. You know, yeah. I like I like women. I travel a lot. We party a lot. We have that pro status that helps getting girls on the couch. I won't lie about it. Yeah, yeah, all of this is true and. I am being true to you. This doesn't mean that I will not be, I will not be um, yours and only yours. Because I've been pretty good to that. When I am with someone, I am with someone. When I am not, I'm definitely not. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, you know, you can't be anyone but yourself. And 
it's admirable that you're willing to talk about so many different things. I appreciate like your honesty and your vulnerability and your, you know, just being real. It's awesome. Thank you very much. It is hard to talk about those things and not wonder about what people will think when they will listen to what I say. Or even the, the way I talk. When I listen to myself right now, I feel like I, I sound dumb because I want to talk well. So I talk very slowly and I use beautiful words because I only listen. Like I, I started speaking English by listening to trap and rap music. So yeah. all my words and all the sentences I, I started with were bad words, you know? Like you mm -hmm. go in France and the word you want to say is, how do I say shit? How do I say whore? You know, well, the same thing is for me. When I speak English, I use bad words a lot. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> and right now, I'm just listening to myself talking to you. I am thinking of how people will listen to this podcast and think, damn, th this little French kid sounds dumb when he talks. He has a feminine way to talk and he tries to tell people how to act or not to act. All those yeah. things go through your mind or my mind and everybody's mind when they open their mouth and those things end up on social medias or to other people. But uh, I've learned within time that, you know, you only have one life, so might as well try it. Might as well yeah. try it for real. You want to talk about this thing or talk about this other thing, I'll, I'll talk about it. I found my way not to lose my sponsors, talk about those things. That's the thing as well, is a lot of skiers and persons are, that I hang out with, like they have a lot to say, but they are worried to say it due to the fact that they have sponsors. Yeah. You know, if they say this bad word or if they talk about drug problems or alcohol problems, they are worried that their fans will tell them they're stupid. Their sponsors will tell them they don't fit to what they want, they want to show to the world. And I am lucky enough to be surrounded by people that accept me and by sponsors that actually believe in my projects and what I do. So I speak freely. And I try not to think about what people think of myself. Yeah, definitely. It's funny. I stopped editing my podcasts and let someone else edit them now because I was becoming too um, critical of myself. I thought, I think I sound stupid in 90% of the podcasts. <laughs> and... I, so I judged myself and I just couldn't even edit it anymore because that thought process in my brain, I was tearing at myself so much instead of realizing that like, oh, there are things that we talk about that will benefit other people. I was just so focused on that, that yeah. negative aspect. Yeah, yeah of couldn't. course. Of course. Of course. Yeah. And I, I totally understand it because you'll think, oh, my voice is too this or I speak to that or... You know, but by the end, like, I've never, like, you will realize that people actually don't care about your pimple or your, of, on your face or the face you do when you react. They will actually listen to what you have to say. And if this thing relates to them, then they will actually listen to you. And that's why what, what is the most, one of the most important things of my project. And I think that's why it works so far. It yeah. is because on another on another side, we go into the snow parks that people ride every day. We don't create projects with helicopters and private snow parks. We do yep. skiing in the areas that are relatable to the people. So if mm -hmm. we talk about problems and issues and even like good good things about life that people can actually relate to, well, it'll be the same with skiing. You will not have to care about how you ski or how you talk or what you look like in front of the camera. If the things are relatable to the people, then people will listen or watch what you have to do or what you have to say. And then yeah. if the things are like 
if they see themselves in what you do or what you say, even though they don't like you, they'll, they'll end up listening to you. And it's a mm -hmm. good thing. You'll have one more customer. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, they may not like you, but they'll respect you. And that's something that I think is, you know, more, more people should sh uh, strive to be respected rather than like liked or admired. Exactly. That is one thing for sure. And that's a discussion I had with uh, A1, the rapper that I have in the movie this year with Keep It Real, is we had this discussion and we talked for hours and it was, we were talking about like this appreci appreciation thing. Like we want people to appreciate us and to respect us and all of those things. I just want people not to annoy me. <laughs> By the end, that's the only thing. Like just, I let people do what they want to do and I do my things the way I want to do them. And yeah. so people that's around me, sponsor and everything, some of them might not agree a hundred percent with what I do, but they will accept it because I do it in an artistic way and I do it in a relatable way. And I think it's an important thing for us. Stay relatable. Yeah. Always Definitely. stay relatable. I think that's one of the things with the ski, the competition scene exploding the way that it has in the last 15 years going from, you know, double, you know, double corks, double flips to... Oh, you started with doubles? When I started skiing, there was no doubles. I right. remember being on the chairlift with um, uh, Cataneo, the coach of uh, Candy Tovex, showing me this video, this video of uh, Jan Olsen doing uh, the kangaroo flip by that time. And I still call it the kangaroo flip. It was the double flat spin 900. It was like, oh, can you see that, man? Oh, we can do doubles now. And by that time, it had been like five years that I was skiing already. So yeah. I didn't start with the doubles. And now I'm like pretty used to quadruples. You know? Yeah. I, I see it's a possibility that one day someone will go quint. <laughs> totally. Right? But it's not relatable. It's not relatable it's not. at all. Yeah. Like, not, not, I, I like it. And I respect every ways of skiing. But 100%. If you want to talk to the people and try to learn them something, you cannot do it with a helicopter and quintuple flips. You want to yeah. do it in Whistler with uh, Jake, who has an actual work, doesn't really have, he has sponsors, but not much money from them. He just works to be able to go skiing, to do straight rails. And then you actually realize, oh, he hand dragged that rail. I have been riding for the past 10 years. Why can't I do this trick? Or, oh, this guy skis, and that's why Candy Tovex works so well. It's because he actually has a camera that costs 500 bucks that everybody buys, and he skis the slope that everybody buys. And yeah. it's either you're jealous of what he does, so you look at it, or you're like, oh, if I buy a camera, I can do the exact same thing as him. In both ways, you will respect the guy. Yeah. From totally. the jealousy to the envy. Yeah, definitely. I think that's one of the things that you're doing really well is being relatable. And, uh, you know, not everyone's going to relate to all pieces of it. Not everyone has been through serious injuries. Not everything, everyone has been, you know, been through that, the lifestyle that you have, but at least. No, I hope they don't. Yeah. Right. And I hope they don't. And one, one very important thing that Jacob says, and that's a little, I shouldn't talk about it, whatever, because I don't care. I'm the producer, so I say whatever I say. Yeah. Uh, Jacob, in his interview, he's saying, like, people ask him, like, uh, how can I become a pro free skier? And his answer is pretty natural. He says, well, you shouldn't try. It's not really an easy life. It's not, you should better, like, go to school and have a good job because it's kind of complicated. Yeah, you guys see it like dream of it and everything but hey, it's not the the funnest sometimes you know but like if i say so in front of someone who is struggling with getting a little money from a job he doesn't like and i tell him well don't try and be me who travels all year long and parties whenever i can you know it, it seems like it seems stupid 
But if you say it in the middle of a movie where you explain how this guy has a reason to say so and has lived the life that, yes, was wonderful and amazing, but in the same time really painful and complicated, then you will listen to him. Yeah. And without being relatable, you cannot talk those words we're trying to talk. And relatable is the word that is a key for us. Yeah. To the rest of the crowd. Definitely. So what's the next the next project's called Keeping It Real? Uh what did you like where did you travel? Who all is gonna be in it? And um what is the next step or facet past would you all right so um well would you was an obligation an obligation in a way that i broke my back and i knew that uh, it was a hit it, it, it had to be a hit because people would like of course they they want to know when people get hurt, they want to know what, what comes out, what comes next, you know. So it was easy for me to go into this subject. Let's talk about my, my broken back instead of anything else. So first thing first, like it was easy to find the subject. And it was also easy to have uh, people reaction because uh, I, you, we all know it. We all know that if we talk about somebody who, when, who like broke his back in front of everybody on TV and then start skiing again, people will go into the theaters to watch it. Yeah. So it wasn't easy to produce and it wasn't easy to make it like the way I wanted it, good or not. But it was easy to get people into the theaters to watch it and onto YouTube to watch it. So it was an obligation as well because I broke my back so I couldn't ski and film myself for six months. So I was like, all right, I can ski but not do tricks. So I might as well hold my camera, film my friends, like film them, do tricks, and then put myself at the end with the little tricks I can do when I'll be able to ski. I ended up in the middle thinking of all the things I was thinking and that making it more of a documentary than it was supposed to be. I was thinking more of a ski porn in the first place because I never wanted to direct a movie because I thought it was stupid because I don't watch ski movies, to be honest. Yeah. But when I came out, like what I, like as I said earlier in the podcast, when I came out with this project, everybody coming back to me with like the, the way that I could help them move on with their problems and with their life or just like, appreciate the fact that it was a happy thing to get hurt not a happy thing to get hurt but like the positive way we could think out of it well i thought you guys think i'm out of that but like i still have a lot of problems i still have a lot of issues and mental health problems due to the fact that i can't accept myself yeah like, it is hard for me to accept myself the way I am. And uh, even after the movie, I know it'll still, it'll still, like, in my entire life, I still grow up to try and, you know, accept myself the way I am. Because once again, I am hyperactive and I think so much that whenever I have two seconds, I, I overthink everything. Yeah. So this movie, Keep It Real, my main problem right now is, like, the way I dress, the way I act, the way I ski, the way I talk, I've never felt like 100% of the people around me would accept me. I think it's even less than 50%. So I want to make a movie for people to accept their, peop them, their little pimple on their face. I want people that dress differently, that do a sport that is different, that listen to a music that people don't listen to, accept the way they are. That's what I, I'm working on right now. Yeah. I figured Henry Carlo has been dressing such a weird way and still is a god to a lot of people. Yeah. Like people accept Henrik the way he is. So if I get to film with him, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the way he dresses. 
and Jakob has been dating a girl for 12 years was nobody out of the well not nobody but most of the people skiing have been going from dates to dates and he's been able to remain with his girlfriend which I haven't been able to let's talk about that and this guy I won't tell, I won't say the name this guy has been partying so much but still made a career out of it let's let's show the people what he has to say yeah totally you know so this movie is about acceptance about accepting yourself about accepting what people think of you and not not caring but accepting it in a good in a good way yeah just try and show the people that we are real people we're not different from anybody as i said earlier glory money girls anything None of this will come the day somebody that is close to you die. Yeah. None of it. Well, you got to realize it. And then if the skiing is good and the talking is good, then you'll be interested in what we have to say. Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. With dealing with uh, those acceptance, uh, those, you know, trying to find acceptance for yourself, have you done anything like... Um, I know for me, I, I tried to get in better routines because I wasn't sleeping uh, well, and, and that was affecting my mental health, and it was affecting my emotions and was causing me to be you know, more bipolar and, and have these you know, high highs and these low lows and started experimenting with meditation. Um, I've even experimented with like microdosing cybacillin mushrooms um, for depression and stuff like that, so... Are there things that you are doing as an active thing to help yourself practice acceptance or, you know, is it just having these conversations with other people and being able to see uh, your pain or other people's pain and, and relate to it or, you know, see other people's experiences that mimic your own? Yeah. I'll go with option B. Yeah. I haven't changed anything in my life. Well, actually, I stopped smoking weed a month ago. Yeah. Which uh, got me through uh, the darkest points of my life again, which is very complicated. But, uh, and I'm not out of it. I think after six months, I'll say I'm out of it. But I won't claim that I'm done with it because I have been, and I haven't said that to anybody because, you know, socials and the fact that I was 20 years old, but I'm turning 30 in two years, so I can talk about it now. But from the day I started being a free skier for real, at 15, I, I smoked my first joint. Yeah. And then I'm 27 years old. And in the first place, it was funny. And it was it a was good time to smoke weed. But now, 12 years later, I'm up to a pack of cigarettes and 10 joints a day. And first thing first I do in the morning is lighting a, lighting a joint. So a month ago and over the past five years, I tried and tried and tried and tried stopping, but I've never been able. So a month ago, I finally quit. I haven't been smoking for a month straight. <laughs> and I don't want to talk about it like I'm... <laughs> you know, like I'm a drug addict, but that's a drug addiction for sure. Yeah. It's well more accepted in the U.S. and Canada, everything, because it's legalized. And I think it's a good thing. It's a good thing when it's medicated, you know. Yeah. But on the rec recreative way, I am doing it like somebody who is drinking 10 beers a day. Yeah. You know, on the recreative way, drinking beers on a Saturday night and blacking the fuck out is a good thing. I think it helps you, you know. There are some layers of your life that you need to cry out on Saturday night. It's a good thing. But if you do it every day on a daily basis, then you're an addict. And I was an addict and I'm still an addict until, you know, the next six months. If I make it through, then I'll say I moved on. So that's the only thing that actually changed. I will, you know, I like partying. I like doing all the things we do when we are our age. And I don't want to change any of those. Yeah, but uh, it's mostly talking to the people, man. Yeah, I've been opening myself so much more 
And the fact that I don't have a girlfriend anymore, that don't judge me, that don't tell me not to rap or not to yell or not to talk this way and just accept myself being on my own in my apartment thinking of the things I want to do with the people I want to do, talk with them, join them, go to places that I've never been and talk about things that I've never talked about with people that don't know me, yeah. help me move on on those things. Yeah, definitely. You know, going, going, going to Virginia to uh, film this rap clip we're filming, we filmed and created for Cupitrial. That was something for sure. I went to Virginia. Virginia is not a place you would go skiing at all. No. It's a very, it's a very black community surrounded by a lot of police. So I was not feeling the most confident, but they accepted me and talked with me like I was part of the crew. And when I felt that, and it didn't take me long because I was... It, it, it had been nine months that I was like learning to talk to people and get accepted real quick because I had two days to spend with those guys. Yeah. And when we started talking and talking and talking and it helped me move on things that were locked in my mind for years. But there are things that will take other years to move on from. Yeah. You know, and you got to accept it and keep on moving, keep on thinking. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, I quit drinking because drinking for me was causing a lot of the high highs and a lot of the low lows. And it was, you know, after I broke my back, um, like a couple months later, I lost one of my best friends. And then that just sent me in this, this spiraling depression. Um, I was in a relationship, but I was, you know, giving it all away sort of thing. And I ended up getting in trouble with the law. And um, I just kind of realized like drinking wasn't, wasn't what I needed to do. And it's been over two and a half years now since I've had any alcohol. And, you know, I still smoke weed, I smoke weed every day. But drinking was, hey, well, congratulations, man. was the one that affected me. And thank you. Um, it, it is hard. And I can't, I can't picture what would be life without drinking i don't say that i drink on the daily basis i don't do it i can go like three weeks without drinking a month without drinking but this life has been made to party as well like all the things we've gone through all the parties will walk we we're welcome to when you're tired and you have to show up well a drink helps that is for sure so i uh, i can't I can try and understand how hard it would be to stop drinking. Yep. But I, I don't want to because it's never been affecting my life. I've never been acting dumb to people. And yeah, I cry from time to time when I'm drunk like everybody, but it's good cries. You know, it's those cries that stay locked when you're sober and finally comes out. So <laughs> maybe it's not good to say that, but drinking has actually been good things for me. Yeah, because it's it's not on a daily basis. I do it like everybody, like from now and then. Yeah, totally. And that was something that I wasn't able to do. And it's something, you know, I think when you, it's something that happens in ski communities a ton uh, out here. Like you've spent time in Summit County. I'm sure you've seen, you know, the people that end up getting caught in that cycle of like every single yeah. day. Oh, yeah their uh yes i mean county is something yeah something else totally so the hibiza and people like in the first place start doing it for partying and end up doing it for a living yeah which is wrong which is bad and that's why i don't want to go there too much because when we go there it's always the same thing yep you hang up with people that party all the time that don't think of the afterlife you know, mm -hmm. what I mean, the afterlife is the day after. Yeah. Because when, when I am up there, because I'm easy to like bring into a party. I'm really easy to bring into a party. So it's hard. Like when I'm there and I'm pretty good at it, I don't party. Mm -hmm. But I know all those people that cannot go without it and like ruined a lot of their career. A lot of skiers up there ruined their career. From partying because it's so easy to party up there. 
Yeah. And people need to realize it. When you're hangover, you're not skiing as well. Or maybe you're skiing as well, but your your body health is 50% of the, his percentage. And if you lay, if you land a little backwards, well, that will be an ACL. Yeah. And you know it. Mm -hmm. We all know it. So when we are skiing, we're not doing it. We we find the right time to party, to do stupid things, you know. That's the thing that I've learned over the course of my career is like to separate things from each other. You party at that time, you fall in love at that time. <laughs> you do those things in the right moment. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think, you know, that's kind of, uh, it's what distinguishes who makes it, you know, further in the sport is the people or further in life in general is the people who kind of are able to compartmentalize and um exactly delay gratification a little bit you know it's like i'm gonna go through this comp i'm gonna ski as best i can but on saturday or on sunday you know sunday night or saturday night, at night we're gonna have some fun no matter what happens and exactly. then you know, that's my one night. Yes. I'm going to have fun. And then, you know, su Sunday or Monday comes around and I'm going out, uh, you know, I'm flying out somewhere else and I'm going to go focus and train again. Exactly. And that's what you want to do. Yep. Compartmentalize everything, you know. You, you don't have to cut on partying because you want to compete. But yeah, if you want to be the numero uno in this game, you cannot drink. Yeah. You cannot. The top skiers on this planet don't drink. They don't. Yeah. Take, uh, I don't know, Gus Kenworthy, Tom Wallace, uh, Bobby Brown, Henry Carlott, all those kids, they don't drink. They don't smoke. They don't party because they focus on their skiing. But then it's up to you to know if you want to experiment those things being drunk and doing those stupid things and having fun doing those or being the number one and having those wins having those prices making that money yeah you want to think of those you know because of course you can do both you can do both but you, you won't be number one you will be for a couple for a couple months for a couple years but it won't last yep you want to last as as the best, you want to have the best health in the world for sure. Impossible to go without it. It was possible five, ten years ago. It was it was very possible, but I swear to God, none of the top top uh, athletes on complicated sports as skateboarding or skiing or golf are people who party. Yeah. Totally. But then I, I won't say don't do it because those people, I think, miss some of the some of what has to be lived when you're young. Mm -hmm. I think it is important to live those things. Yeah. So I'll, I'll leave it up to the people to make their choice and I'll give people everybody's opinion about it. But yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I made my choice. Yeah. And I think that kind of comes down to like knowing yourself and knowing, you know, knowing what you really truly want out of life. Because I think a lot of people kind of look at someone like Gus or Bobby or uh, Tom Wallace or, you know, any, any of those guys. And they say like, I, I want to be that person, but I think that's one of the things that is so awesome about what you're doing is you're exposing the the full story because a lot of the times, like you said, it, you know, people only get the highlights from social media and yeah. yeah and on social media, you show just, you want to, just what you want to show, yep. you know, and we're not superstars. You're going to put that in perspective that we're not superstars with million followers. Well, Gus is, <laughs> But we can we can still hide, you know. We can still like, the, you can still be an al al alcoholic and even like have crack problems, and still like not show it to anybody because you will just post one picture a day, and we don't have any paparazzi around us. Yeah. So you just show what you want to show. That's the thing. I, I was showing only the good thing about what we was doing, 
and I thought at some point it might be interesting to share the bad things as well. Yeah, totally. Do you do any sort of like meditation or anything like that? Yeah, I edit movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do as a meditation. Whenever I start to meditate, man, I, I told you now, I'm hyperactive. It's impossible for me to lay on the ground and do yoga. I do yoga because I need to do it for my body. Yeah. But I don't do it like in a meditation way. Yep. No, I can't. It is impossible for me. Maybe it is because I don't force myself to be true. But I don't want to. I'm, I'm in a good place with my mind. And I don't want to go into meditation because it might bring myself into a bad place. Okay. Yeah. That's the truth about it. Yeah, totally. I can definitely, I can see that because, you know, I think from what it sounds like, my mind is very similar to yours in that you give it too much time to think and it'll make a, it'll wreak havoc. Um, yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I don't know what would happen if I start, like, I think, like, already way too much during my sleep. I don't need to, and I don't have time to stop and, and meditate. Yeah. And it's not something that attracts me as well. I think way now. Yeah. And thinking on my own will not help myself. My, my meditation is actually driving. Okay. Like, uh, I, ha I live half my time two hours from my place, so I have to drive two hours from my place like pretty often. And I really like that time driving because I actually think. But those two hours that happen every now and then are way enough because when I get there, I'm exhausted. Yeah. Because I think so much. It exhausts me, man. I'm tired when I get there. I can't work because <laughs> I've worked too much on my brain. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> What's one thing that you use to like overcome fear of telling, you know, telling people the truth or, you know, like if you're dealing with something and you, you, you know, you want to say something that, uh, you know, could possibly it's the truth, but it could possibly have a negative effect on, on you or or other people what's something that you like do or tell yourself or um how do you that's a complicated one but um i'm not sure if i'm gonna answer right this question but what i think is is if you have something that can help people move on and improve the way they act or the way they live or whatever if it's a good thing that can help them improve anything then think about it twice about the words you you will use and say it but if it is just oh you became fat oh you're talking that this way then no i, I would just like keep my mouth shut with that uh, which i use not to do because french people are pretty straight and Moreover, my parents, that's, that's the thing, is like my parents have always been pretty straight to me. And whenever I pull up after travel to the U.S., my mom would look at me and instead of saying hi, she would tell me, oh, you look fat. <laughs> and I think it doesn't help me at all because I know I am fat by that time. Yeah. But maybe if she used the right words and would say, hey, Pan Pan, maybe next time when you go there, you should try and treat yourself a little better. Because you look like shit right now. <laughs> well, maybe, well, maybe it, yeah. you know, it's the use, the use of your words and the use of your impact. I, you have much more impact than you think. That's what people need to realize. And that's why it takes me so long to create those projects. It's because I overthink everything two, three, four times to make sure I don't hurt anybody, you know? Yeah. So sometimes you're in a family reunion and you're talking about that girl who got fat and actually you look at your, your aunt and you realize she got fat in the same time and you're like, oh, shit, I should have kept my mouth shut or I should have used words differently. Yeah. That's, that's the, the biggest thing I've tried to do is think more before acting. I think it's a very important thing in life. 
Definitely. Yeah, I think, you know, choosing your words uh, very carefully is something that um, a lot of people don't have much practice in. And sometimes it can, yeah, you never know who you can help when you, you know, when you are trying to share something that can help someone else, but you also never know who you can hurt when you're not thinking exactly. and when you're just kind of mindlessly. Yeah. Just don't say whatever goes through your mind. Yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, somebody pulled up to a party I was at and looked at me. I, ne I, never, met that, I never met that guy. He looked at me and told me, hey, uh, you should maybe uh, stop skiing. So I was pretty drunk. I look at the guy. I'm like, all right. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to like what you're going to say, but go ahead. And he keeps going. He looks at me and is like, because uh, it seems like you're better at landing on your head than at landing on your skis. And I looked at the guy. I was like, man, you know, I almost died from that thing. And I'm pretty sure I'm still a very good skier. So why the, why the fuck are you saying that to me? Yeah. He didn't say anything. He just laughed at me and left. Yeah. And of course, I went home and I was drunk and ended up crying with my cigarette on the balcony. You know, it affected me in a way I wasn't expecting. You know, I was having a good time. The party was going great. I was hanging with a girl that was very good. And no, I just left. I was like, oh, fuck that shit. I'm going home. Yeah. I, I, no, I don't belong here. So, yeah, this person, and I'm not, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure he was just trying to be fun, you know, and maybe it was just a funny way for him to introduce himself. It wasn't fun at all. I didn't, ha I didn't laugh and it really affected me. It affected me in a bad way for a couple of days. And my way to getting out of it was telling on socials. And then my socials blew up on the day I talked about it. And as always, it just pushed me into my project. So I used what was wrong to make a good thing, you know. What was bad, what happened bad to me, I used it in a, in a good way to learn on life and to learn on what i have to say and how i will talk to people in the future yeah don't t don't tell people like oh your dress is shit why would you say so it's done you know like why would you say oh this tattoo looks like shit man it's done it's a tattoo you you won't change it yeah you can cover it but people won't cover it you know you don't like my tattoo just don't talk about it yep understand that you don't like the tattoo that's okay yeah you know totally but you don't have to ruin my opinion of it because you don't like it exactly it's not because you have an opinion that you have to talk it freely yeah to say it freely some things are good to say if they can improve people's life some things are not yep so yeah that would be my answer oh dude this conversation is awesome i'm enjoying it a lot <laughs> I'm glad you do, man. I'm glad you do. It's like going to the psychologist for me. <laughs> but instead, everybody will listen what I have to, to say to my psychologist. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> hope it's beneficial for you. I hope you're enjoying it as well. It is always, man. Yeah. It is always my pleasure. Um, on a lighter note, where's like one of your favorite places you've ever traveled? Where's your favorite place to travel for skiing or one of, or a couple? It's very hard because we've been to so many places, but uh, Japan is a definitely the best place on earth, I think. Because people don't judge anybody. First thing first, yeah, of course, the skiing is amazing, as you guys have been able to watch. But people don't judge anybody. You would see uh, people in Tokyo dressed uh, like animals going to the office. You know? <laughs> and um, the food is amazing. The food is like everything I like. It's, it's really healthy. And there, there, there is so much in the community and in the, life, in the lifestyle, in the architecture, in the fashion I like. They're so ahead of us. Everything is so different, and it's also the only place on earth we travel for skiing that is actually different. 
because when we travel for skiing, everything is so European, everything is so classic with the lift and the security and the way mountains are managed by the management on on site. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in Japan, everything is so different. So yeah, of course, Japan is, if I would have to tell anybody to go skiing somewhere, it would be Japan. Yeah. For sure. Wherever in Japan, man. Wherever. I still need to make it to Japan. Maybe it'll happen this year. And it's actually way more affordable than people think. Yeah. The, the, the price of the flights have been decreasing so much over the past decade. And the stay are pretty much the same as Europe and USA, which is average. Then the the passes are like 60, 70 bucks, which is cheap for the US, but very expensive for Europe. But so worth it because the snow is so light and there are not so many good skiers up there. So you, you'll you have the freshest, you know, it's not Whistler, it's not Aspen. Yeah. Don't go to Niseko then. Okay. Although Niseko is definitely the place where all the Austrian pe all the Australian people go to and Australian people are really good skiers. Yep. So if you go to Niseko, it's a very good place to party. It's like Whistler, but then you won't get the freshest. It's like Whistler. At 5 a.m. there will be a queue in front of the lift. Yeah. Just go to the underground. Underground places. Omo Hotel. Omo Hotel. Shout out to Omo Hotel. has been hooking up everything for us. They had places everywhere with just everything we would dream of with nobody merci, with nobody around to ski. Just fresh is every day. Yeah. Just we've been so lucky on this last trip. It's been dumping three feet every night. Dumping three feet every night and bluebird every day. Dang. Is it, and the the like the lightest snow you've ever felt. Yeah. So underneath, under two feet, you would still use your park ski because it's so light, you go through it. Wow. And then after three feet, so awesome. Yeah. Like you could have five feet of fresh snow and still be able to go down with like a middle type of uh, hill, you know, yeah. not middle, middle steep yeah, yeah. type of hill. After that, no, it's, all, it's awesome. Japan for sure, 200 person. And then La Clusa. You want to ski a very good resort, the best resort in the world? The best resort in the world is right in front of the, my balcony right now. Yeah. It, it's so freaking awesome. You guys think it's just because of Candid? No, it's not. It's because of the hill. Candid has become such a good skier, not just because of his abilities. A lot of people have Candid abilities. I see, I see it in people. But he became who he became because of the, the place he was skiing. That is one thing for sure. Yeah, totally. No, I mean, the, the resort just looks amazing. It looks like there's so many amazing natural features and places to push yourself and, you know, like no trees. So you have so much open space to play. Well, that is the thing that you guys have only seen La Balme, which is one fifth of the resort. So you guys know this place where you can do skis yep. without no trees, but that's only one fifth of the resort. And he, he's always there because he lives on his house is actually on the parking lot. So it's so easy for him to go up there. And that's why he's always been up there. Yep. But there is like four fifth of the, of the resort you haven't watched. And that's what I've tried to film this year when I was up there is like there are so many more options than you think. Yeah. The whole, the entire resort is like the, pretty much the same as where Kenny skis, but with trees, with a snow park, with like bike parks you can ride in the winter. Sick. And yeah. It's awesome. It's a family resort. It's not a party resort, but it's awesome. Yeah. I've, I've, I've skied there my entire life and... Uh, I'll be buried there for sure. Yeah. It's the place you want to be at for sure, for sure. I will definitely have to make it out for sure. Just make it out. Yep. I'll help. I'll help out with the passes and with the lodging. It's pretty easy for us.
because we've been helping them and they are being helping us. Yeah. It's it's 50, 50 50, you know. Yeah, totally. Well, I'll let you know. I'll let you know when I book flights. <laughs> Whenever, my man. Whenever. You're awesome. And passes are pretty pretty cheap, actually. Yeah. Because uh, we we always think as French people that uh, forty bucks for for a pass is expensive. <laughs> Because that's what we think. Like we think it's a rich sport, but it is a rich sport. Yeah. But it's only forty bucks right. for the day pass. That's not bad. Whereas, especially, uh, uh, you pull up in Aspen and you go, "All right, that's a rich sport. Uh, that's something else." You know, be, being a skier in the U.S., man, I I can't. You know, it's hard. It's hard, and that's why also I think we're we're relatable, and I can actually talk to the people is. Both my parents never made over two thousand a month each, never, ever. Yeah. So I don't come from a rich family. Like uh, everything's been really hard for us. Not not like normal life has been easy for sure. My parents made sacrifice, so it was easy for us. But going skiing, I knew I had to do good. Yep. Very quick, very fast. I had to make my sponsors proud and my sport club proud because I wouldn't be able to afford skiing. Because 40 bucks for a day pass is like unaffordable for a family like us. Yeah. Because I come from family like any other family. Yeah, definitely. And, and I need to people to realize it so they can actually listen to me. Because if, if they think I can afford an helicopter and a day pass in Aspen, then they're wrong. And they won't listen to me because if they think I'm that rich kid who got, who got it easy. Yeah. Which, which is not. Definitely. Yeah. And it, yeah, it makes it more relatable and more attainable and something that, you know, people, I think people put limits on their life just because they, they say, Oh, you know, someone else had more talent, had more skill, had more access, had more. No, this and, no. Fuck that. Yeah. Fuck that. Yeah. I had one kid calling me today and uh, asking me uh, how I got into uh, filming those uh, rap superstars that I filmed last year. I just told him well, I worked hard to produce content that was not music related, but still that was like kind of related because it was fashion. I worked it on my free time to put it out right in the moment when they, they asked for a filmer. It was like, um, but I don't have time. I was like, what are you doing? Well, I'm, stu I'm studying uh, video. All right, you're just studying video. All right, how much time do you sleep every night? I sleep 10 hours a night. Well, I sleep four hours a night for the past two, three, four, five years. You know, whatever you want, you get it by working as hard or twice as hard or five times as hard as anybody. Yeah. And I think that that is why I am 27 years old and still living out of my passion, it is because cocky or not, saying it, I work harder than anybody I know. Yeah. Anybody I know in this industry. Yeah. Well, n not as Enric. Enric is a fucking extraterrestrial and works 10 times harder than anybody, but that's why he's where he is. And that's why also Gus Kenworthy is not skiing as well as he did it is because he's been working 10 times harder than anybody and now he got distracted by those new york thing and the fashion everything and now he doesn't work as much as before and that's why we don't see him so much in the skiing as much as we used to yeah definitely to be honest yeah if you want to achieve things whether you come from a rich community or not Work is the only thing that will make you through. Of course, clout and connections are a very, very important fact. But work, man, work is the only thing that will make it, that will make you go through all of it. Yeah, that will pull up, 
pull you out of the rest of the crowd. Yeah. And you got to start. So many people just don't even start. They have all these dreams in their head and they're like, oh, yeah. I want to do this yeah. and that. Yeah. Oh, I cannot be a filmer because I don't have a camera. Well, I'll be honest with you. When I started the company, I started the first six months of the company. I didn't own a camera. Yeah. I was taking contracts on a bet that I would be able by the time of the contract to, um, to, uh, to uh, how do you say that to hire i was <laughs> like let's say i would uh, take a contract on march and on april would be the date of the filming well on the 20th of march i took the, my first contract and i had 10 days to find to f to hire somebody under 200 bucks for the day to be able to shoot the the thing and then i would be able to edit it yeah so i did it on the first time it worked I was paid a thousand bucks and I gave 200 to the filmer. Yep. Well, the filmer took an hour to film the thing and I took 10 hours to, to edit the thing. So it was damn right. And I did that for the, for the next six months, you know? And so stop saying like, because I don't have the gear, because I don't have the connection because of this, because of that. If you wake up before people, if you, Go to bed after the people. I swear to God, people will, shit will go your way at some point. Yeah. You know? Just work your way out. Stop complaining about the fact that I am black, so people don't want to hire me. That's not right. My black friends get paid more than you do, and you are white people. <laughs> uh, that, that's facts. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. You know, hundred percent. Not, and that's why I want people to spread positivity. Is because if you go positive and you wake up and be like, "All right, I'm, a, I'm gonna make it my own way. I'm gonna make it possible. You, you'll make it possible." You know? Yeah. It, it is possible to like make it. It is possible to become rich. It is possible to become famous. It is possible to fall in love. It is possible to have kids. All those things are, are possible, not just because it's going to fall on you, but because you wake up early and do the right things to make it happen. Yeah. Of course, you can have a job, but a shitty job, if you, if you, you don't, are not more motivated to any, in, more than anybody, of course, you can have kids, but not with the right person because you're just too lazy to wait for the good person. Yeah. You know? Yep. Definitely. Um, what does success mean to you? Like, what what does it mean for you to be successful? What does it mean for me to be successful? Well, I'll be pretty honest with you. I think that by the time I die, I will not have a clue on this. <laughs> I don't think success is... A, the end the end of the game you know the end of the point success will be having my family healthy my mind free of any any problems and being loved by the person that loves me back normally yeah that's all i want i just want to be healthy i just want my people to be healthy I don't really care about being rich or famous or respected. And that's why I think my project, I direct them a little different than anybody is because, well, not anybody, the bunch does it the same way, but I don't care about people watching it. I don't care about having a million views and making a lot of money out of it. I just want to do my things, you know, it, it works well, good because I will have, in, have an impact on it, on people. It doesn't work. No problem. I'll, I'll be proud with what I pull out. Yeah. You know, and the same way with skiing, I've never, and that's all, that's pretty much why I've never been one of the top dogs is because I never cared about being the number one. 
I just wanted to be happy. I wanted to go to the party. I wanted to enjoy all those things in life. Success will be going through all of it healthy with my people healthy. Yeah. Health. Health is success for sure. For sure. Totally. Mental, physical, spiritual. I, we can we can put it like in the like the material way, and I can give you numbers. Success is four four fucking billions. <laughs> You know, no success is different thing for me. Yeah, like I, I I've seen I've seen success, um, I've seen success destroy people. Yeah, I've seen success make people shy, whereas they were normal people. I don't think success. I don't know. It it is a very complicated subject, but success is happiness. If you're happy with your life, you've succeeded. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Totally. If if success is making money and being famous and having ladies on your bed, then good for you if it makes you happy. Yeah. If it is just numbers, if it is just binaural, just like mechanical, mm -hmm. nah, nah, I don't think a Porsche is a success. I don't think a Gucci shirt is a success, you know? Yeah. I think being healthy and spreading positivity around you. And of course, like, of course, making money with that. Because like people say money doesn't make you happy. Yeah, but uh, being poor makes you very unhappy as well. Yeah, totally. You know? It's hard to be healthy uh, when you don't have the resources to to allow yourself exactly. to have those, you know. The yeah, we got to stop with that. Uh, making money doesn't make you make you happy. No, it's wrong because you, you need you need a little money to to be healthy now. Moreover in the US that is for sure. Yeah. But success is not being respected by my peers. Success is not being able to do these tricks or whatever. It is just Making th making it through everything with my people healthy and myself healthy. Yeah, this is what success means for me. Totally, I love it. Um, what's one piece of advice you'd pass along to someone who wants to do what you do, like travel, uh, film, anything, any uh, skiing, overcoming an injury? anything one advice just stay passionate do it for passion don't do it for anything because if you do it for clout if you do it for what people call success by the way uh if you do it for the girls if you do it if you're doing it like everybody goes to to school for for your parents or for anything else then just the thing you're doing for you're gonna fall and and when you fall the fall is gonna be hard stay passionate 200 person if it doesn't passionate you find something around it that will passionate you enough not to lose sight of it and if you really lose sight of skiing or skateboarding of those passions well it's like a girlfriend it, it was maybe not meant for you doesn't mean that you're not meant for another thing another girlfriend or another sport yeah just stay passionate don't lose passion i have seen from very close people like my mom my mom doesn't own any passion and i'm glad she doesn't speak english because she will never listen to that because that would be hard for me to tell her that but she doesn't have any passion and I can see what's an empty, an empty mind. Yeah. She wakes up, goes to work, makes, makes food, complain about the conference. She goes to bed every day for the past 40 years. And that's why I have been seeking for something different in my life. It is because I have been surrounded by people that didn't have a goal, something to wake up to always 
find something to wake up to. Yeah. It does. It won't. It will not make you an Olymp an Olympic winner. But it might. Yeah. You know, might as well reach for the moon. You 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 might end up on the stars. Exactly. You know. And if always follow your passions, try and find passion, passionate yourself into something. And that's what will help you when you have a breakup, when you break a leg or whatever is hard in life, you will go through it thanks to passion. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And when you do follow that path of passion, you know, like I think things kind of just fall into your lap that you, you don't even expect things that you could have never predicted. You know, I, I don't know if I could have ever predicted that I would be on a video call talking to you right now, but I, you know, became. No, exactly. Yeah. And I wouldn't have, and I wouldn't have it. We wouldn't have. Because I remember one day I was at the water ramp and I was uh, 15 years old. It was the first time I was going with the ski club. And uh, I was with uh, Laurent Thévenet. I, I don't think you know, but Laurent Thévenet was uh, the, um, the kid that was going with Mick Deschno. Mick Deschno, the ninth word kid with the tattoo. Mm -hmm. You know, the free ski legend. And I was with him and uh, Aurélien Fournier. And they were both winning everything by that time. They were 17 years old and saying, uh, I think I'm done with skiing by the end of the year. They were 17 years old, going in onto their 18th, and they were already over passions. They were over passions, whereas it was giving them a very good living. By that time, skiing was paying very well, so I wouldn't say numbers, but they were, they were getting paid much more than I ever got paid and I made a living out of skiing. And they lost, they lost their passion. And 10 years later, I'm pretty sure if we talked with them, they would be like, if I hold it on to those passions, I would have had a better life than I have right now. Yeah. Even though they make a lot of money, they made, they, they, they're really... They made a very good life, and I'm pretty proud of those guys. I'm very proud of those guys. But they had their tough time for a couple of years where uh, I think they regretted the, the way they acted. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, I can definitely relate. I lost my passion for ski racing, and I wish that I would have just realized that I was – I just wanted to do something different, and it took me a couple of years uh, you know, when I was 19 and, and 20 and 21 to realize that skiing was what I wanted to do, but I just didn't want to race anymore. And, you know, was... but it is a normal thing as well. Mm -hmm. it, it is a normal thing. You don't have to blame yourself for that. Yeah. It is a normal thing. Like you know, things move on and, uh, and you lose passion for it. Like a girlfriend, you always come back to the same thing. Like a girl. Yeah. You always lose sight of it. Totally. But I'm pretty, I'm pretty glad I lost passion for my girlfriend. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> I never get, get, regretted those. Yep. And we shouldn't. No. We shouldn't. We shouldn't because we are still young and healthy. And instead of complaining about the fact that, oh, I'm not as good as uh, I was when I was a kid. Who cares? Just go back there. Try again. Yeah, you'll see. You still have the the skills. It will take you more time to get back at it. But I'm 27 years old, and I thought my career would be ended by 23. And I'm pretty sure it's just getting started. So why wouldn't you? Totally. I love that, man. Absolutely love it. What's one piece of encouragement or wisdom that you've received that's stuck with you, or something that you kind of go back to? Encouragement. Yep. Well, it might, was it by? It might make me. It might make me cry just thinking about it. My uh, biggest encouragement is uh, my daily inspiration, who is a uh, Hugo Lodger. He is my best friend and a uh, pro free skier from France. He is the kid that looks like Mario Kart in my movie, that uh, does the double in uh, La Cruza in Would You. He's, uh, he's been my main uh, inspiration since day one. 
because him and his father has have never been affected by anything in life except except what they do and how they feel. They don't really I wouldn't say they don't care, but a girlfriend has never been affecting their their way of thinking. If a girlfriend is not good to them, they they just move on to another girlfriend. If a sport doesn't belong to them, then they just move on to another sport. And uh, our um, Hugo's best friend, Dylan Flory, Dylan Flory, I'm pretty sure you have seen on social media, um, got an accident. He's a pro skier from Les Deux Alpes. Um, he had a car accident last year, and um, during this car accident, he made it made him uh, quadriplegic, mm-hmm. quadriplegic, which means um, his head moves and uh, his right arm moves a little bit. Uh, n- none of the rest of his body works, so. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't even like what you ask it wouldn't even be words, but it would be facts, it would be acts, it would be the the way Hugo and Dylan act together as a group to make Dylan's life a little more easy every day. Cause Hugo never ever treated Dylan different differently. Than he did before he got his his uh, his accident, mm-hmm. and seeing this kid who is so happy with life, who doesn't care about anything, not on the way like he doesn't care about people, but he doesn't care about people's opinion, or he doesn't care about the bad things. Is like he he's always been taking the good things, and this plus. Me breaking my back, plus Kevin Rowland almost losing his life. Like, all those things affecting my best friend who's never cared really about anything and seeing him being able to go through all of those things. This is what inspires me the most. Like, this is no advice. He didn't tell me. He told me so much about myself and about how I, he was proud of, but I never really listened. But when I saw him acting with me and with Dylan and with Kevin and never crying, never complaining, never being, you know, he never left any of us. None of us ever suffered from losing a friend because we always had Hugo. Yeah. So the best advice would be go on Instagrams. Go on Instagram. My, be- my best advice I ever got was go on Instagram, follow Hugo Lodger and watch him leave. Watch him leave being happy. Being happy and spreading positivity to the entire world. Just showing the world how you should take everything in and let everything out. Take the good things, leave the bad things. Yeah. Love it. That's what I would say. Uh, I'm not sure in, in English it means anything. I'm sorry, but... No, it means a lot. I just followed him and I'll put that link into... Hugo Lodger is definitely... An- that's also why I want to direct my own project is because I want to promote the right people to the right people. Because I think yeah. there are a lot, there is a lot of hype with Cloud Chaser from the industry that I've never really skied but can do triples or quadruples. And there is not enough hype with the people who have a story to tell and a hype to share. Yeah. Yeah, man. No, I have a friend who. I will. I'll definitely check him out. I have a friend who's a quadriplegic who uh, we grew up going to the same school. He was a motocross racer and a 
a really good BMXer, and he ended up uh, falling off a three-story balcony and breaking his neck. And I go and spend time with him every couple weeks. And my dad also has MS, so he's in a wheelchair. And it's amazing how much perspective. I'm sorry, what is MS? MS is multiple sclerosis which is your white blood cells attack the outer layer of your brain called myelin sheath mm -hmm. and it scars over and so your brain doesn't s send uh the right signals to the rest of your body all right and so his legs will jump a little bit he'll get fatigued very quickly um mm, so poor kid Growing up with my dad, uh, he was able to be there for me. It's one of those things where, like, uh, another – from the outside, it could look really bad, but, um, you know, he was there for me. He took me to most of my ski races. Both my parents were very supportive, but um, he was able to take me out to Mount Hood, and, and I was able to ski Mount Hood a lot, and um, – you know, it's one of those things where my dad and I have a stronger relationship because of the disease. And then, you know, my friend, um, because I've spent so much time around the disease, it's it, it's been a lot easier for me to be there for my friend Jake, who's in a wheelchair, who, you know, both my dad and Jake have such positive attitudes about life. And it's awesome. It's that same thing where, you know, they still deal with, with – um, their their fair share of issues and they get frustrated but most of the for time for sure for sure have... and i got so much respect for those people and dylan has been it is hard for him but yeah. i'm sorry keep on going please no and um it's just amazing what when you see what uh what people are able to go through and able to have a good attitude through um you know exactly. it really puts the perspective in in your for life for sure and then you look at you look up to them and you're just like, all right, my breakup isn't that bad. My, my, my broken leg isn't that bad. I lost my job, but I can still move on. Yeah. You see? And that's why I say my back problem was one of the best things that happened to me is also because of that. Because I know that I could have gone through way, 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 way not even way more it would have been another world you know you enter another world when you become to this when you go into this situation yeah and it doesn't mean you cannot complain that's the thing also people think that because you've gone through that you cannot complain no it's it is not right you can still complain because you have a headache you can still complain because you have lost your job but you cannot complain for weeks and you cannot blame people for those shit that happened to you that you caused yeah for things you caused if then a car enters you and you a car crashes into you and you have those things well yeah it is way harder to move on from those tragic accidents but you need to move on we yeah. all need to move on because if you don't move on, then people around you will not move on, and you, you, you own that to the to the people that's around you. And I think people like your dad or or your friend and my friend Dylan, one of the main things that help them move on is themselves forcing themselves to be happy. So us kids cannot feel as guilty to be healthy next to them yeah yeah that was when my friend passed away shortly after breaking my back i remember feeling so much shame and guilt because i felt like he deserved to live so much more than i did yeah. and that's why i ended up drinking is, so much it is it is hard it is hard mm -hmm. we all blame ourselves for the problems of people and you're just like shit i should have been there for this guy 
but then a hundred person around this guy should have been there. We we all should have been there, you know. And I and I should have been there for this guy. We should have been there for this guy. But then it's a whole shame, and we just gotta learn from those things and know how to like detect and know when people don't do good and how to help them. Yeah. You know, it's not just by saying, all right, you're going to move on from it. Oh, it's not that bad. Sometimes it's just, it's different things. Yep. You know? Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a process, man. Uh, I think by 70, 20, 80 years old, I hope I don't make it through 90 because then I'll be too slow and too slow being <laughs> hyperactive. Picture myself. I'll be like myself right now in the couch. I'll still have the same brain, uh, hopefully. <laughs> I'll go like very fast in my brain. My body can go slow. I'll go crazy. You know, I yeah. think a good death would be 87 years. 87, I would have done good. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to do a hundred five. I don't want to do a record. I will have done enough by eighty seven, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, helping each other—that's one of the main things that keep us alive, I think. Definitely. More than chasing clout, chasing money, chasing a girl, just helping yep. each other. People we love, people we care of, and even people we don't like. Because some of the people we don't like will pick out our best friend within the be next 20 years. It's not because you don't like people now that they're not good people. You'll see good thing in them within a certain yeah. amount of time. And yeah. you'll understand why they hated you and why you hated them. And help each other grow up is also one of those things. I made peace yeah. with a lot of people that hated me. Even though they never apologized for things, I swear to God, they were wrong on it. I really think they were wrong on it. But yeah. I made peace with them and it helped me move on. Yeah. And accept myself because now that I moved on with my worst enemies, whoever can tell me what. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Totally. Yeah. Like, tell me whatever you think. Tell me whatever. You... I don't care. I have the few people that I I care about that care about me and I'll be enough. Yeah. If you could have one significant impact in the world, what would it be? Say you're 87 and on your deathbed and you looked back and you're like, yep. Love yourself. Okay. Not too much. Not not enough. But just love yourself. Accept yourself yeah. as you are. Try and do good around you. Be the best person you can be. And everything good can, will happen to you. Of course, if you're, you're born in an area that things are difficult, it will be harder for you than anybody. That's one thing for sure. But if you do good, good things will happen to you. Yeah. Don't try and fight for the wrong reason. Fight for the right reason. It is important to fight. Never yeah. let anybody... I would say that again. If I, if I had one advice to anybody, it is don't let anybody put you down. Don't let anybody tell you your dreams are too big or your ideas are too wrong. You are who you are and the way you think is the right way. Then just accept everybody's opinion, take the good, pull out the wrong. And you, if you have problems, try to get help, not return yourself to what yeah. you think or what people think of you. Love That's what it. I would say. Um, do you have a favorite travel tip or travel hack? Something as uh, simple as, you know, uh, 
drink water on the plane or you know you've done we've you know we do a lot of traveling so what i travel i try and uh comment tu dis draguer en anglais i try and flirt with uh, every uh who are the people who work in the plane yeah the, how uh, do you call stewardess the yeah the flight attendant flight yeah. attendant yep yeah Try and try and get the the phone number of the flight attendant. Yeah, it'll, it'll keep keep you. Uh, if you're if you're not able to sleep without taking pills, well then try and get the phone numbers of the flight attendants. It will yeah. give you the most pride you'll ever get because they're sexy <laughs> and they're nice and they they talk with so many people that they will never get your attention. But if you try and make it through their attention and get their phone number, you'll be the proudest kid in the world. Yeah. Yep. The most proud. Yeah, that's my tip. Try try and make friends. Love it. No, that's awesome. For sure. <laughs> and where's the best place for people to find you? I'm sure like I would love to do another interview at some point. Um I gotta pee really bad and I figure you probably want to do some editing and um yeah for sure so we'll for wrap sure. things up and you know where can people find you follow what you're doing i think that yeah, what you're doing is super important in the community um i love the stories that you're telling and and the stories that you've told and um so yeah where can people find your previous work and and when is um keeping it real dropping um Well, thank you first. But uh, people can find me on Instagram at Jeremy Pancras and on YouTube at Jeremy Pancras Visuals. And the movie will be dropping in the theaters on the 8th of October. Then we'll be touring for a month and a half in the theaters worldwide. It'll be free on YouTube by the end of November on Jeremy Pancras Visuals at YouTube. Perfect. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much. I appreciate this conversation a lot and uh, I'll be in touch when I schedule my flights. For sure, man. You're very welcome to pull up whenever you feel like. I always have an extra room for the homies and for the people who share the same passion as me, whether it is skiing, filming, or whatever you you like whatever your is your passion i always have a room for you and a place where we can all talk about our passions love it brother well thank you so much i hope you have a great rest of your evening thank you you too man it was nice to talk with you and i hope the podcast goes good and you make a career out of it because you deserve it Fashion first, man. Fashion first. Thank you, brother. Hey, just one more thing before you go. I wanted to say thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I hope that you really enjoyed it. A uh, couple things that I would ask that you do if you enjoyed today's episode. Number one, go follow us at Instagram, on Instagram, at The Athletic Stance Podcast. Number two, if you don't mind leaving a review, rating it, and subscribing, it always helps. It helps spread the word. It helps me know what you guys are enjoying or not. And if you don't mind leaving a comment on Instagram, letting me know what you're enjoying, what you're not enjoying, I will always take into consideration and feel free to send me a message with recommendations on who you'd like to hear from, what you'd like to hear me talk about, us talk about. And as always, thank you so much for listening, for your time, and we'll see you next time at the Athletic Stance Podcast.